This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Get 31 days of streaming completely free using the link curiositystream.com slash featurehistory or you can wait until the end to hear more. Hello and welcome to a featurette that only appeals to me. But hey, I was on holiday so you can give me a break. In this video I combine an interest in cars and the fact that I'm Australian so that we can talk about the Australian car industry and where the hell it went. So, strap in, crack open a watery Queensland beer, and do a sick cunt you burn out, because we're going to delve right in on how this fine nation managed to fake an entire industry. Obviously, we have to start the story with Australia's first car, the Holden in 1948. Except it wasn't, because Holden is a liar. Instead, going back to the late 19th century, Australia first saw cars being brought in from overseas. And due to Australia's symptom of being in the middle of nowhere, they were stupid expensive. So at the turn of the century, Australia would become an actual country and it would see its first car, the Tarrant Automobile. There were a whole 16 of these made, all by hand, and they too would be very, very expensive. So it was when the famous and affordable Model T Ford arrived at Australia's shores, Tarrant and many other companies would change over to becoming Ford assemblers. And this would become the standard of the Australian car industry, an industry of assemblers. American cars for American roads was all Australia new until about the 1930s. Ford would introduce the Ute variant for the first time, and it was only sold in Australia, so that would be the first time the country had a bit of its own design. However, Holden, who had humble beginnings as a saddler in the 19th century, was bought up by the American General Motors and began to dream big. They worked away as yet another assembly plant, but aspired to create a uniquely Australian car. After the Second World War, General Motors would pass on a scrapped Chevrolet design, and Holden began production on it, titling it the FX. The car would be unveiled by the Prime Minister, Ben Chifley, in the middle of Melbourne in 1948. Holden was relentless with his advertising that saw the car dubbed the first Australian car. So Holden, owned by an American company and using an entirely American design, was totally able to convince Australia and began to dominate the market. People were proud to own their country's own car, and they soon introduced Ute variant was the cherry on top. Or should I say, the sauce on the pie. <coughs> However, Ford wasn't going to just turn its back on this market. Instead, in 1958, Ford began spending big time. They wanted to see Ford Australia put up as a strong competitor and see future cars be 85% Australian made. And so they built a massive assembly plant in Broadmeadows, Victoria. Using local production, they were able to bring in the American Falcon XK at a competitive price to the Holden. However, despite Ford Australia's re-engineering, the Falcon didn't cut it. It was seen as fragile. So the 60s saw Ford only able to tailgate Holden's success, as Holden began exporting their cars to New Zealand, Africa, America, Asia and the Middle East. The Falcon XP released in 1965 would be Ford's final make or break in the Australian market. Ford would publicly showcase five of the new model Falcons in a 9 day endurance test, seeing the cars maintain an average of 112 km an hour over 112,000 km. The test was risky, four of the cars in fact rolled over, but Ford had broken several records and proved the Falcon a now reliable car. The 60s would also mark the beginning of Bathurst. Now the most famous annual race in Australia, Bathurst started as a competition for stock cars made or assembled in Australia, and while many brands competed, the race cemented competition between Holden and Ford. A win on the track on Sunday meant sales in the showroom on Monday. And at last, the 60s would also see Japanese manufacturers moving into Australia. In the late 50s, Toyota Land Cruisers, for the first time, were brought over to Australia for use in the Snowy Mountain Scheme. And a decade later, Toyota opened its first factory outside of Japan, in Melbourne. So with both Ford and Toyota competing for Holden's top spot, Holden would come back with the release of its most popular car, the Commodore, in 1978. However, despite Commodore's current reputation as an iconic Australian car, 
Its initial release saw it as more cramped and smaller than its Falcon competitor. Entering into the 80s, Holden would actually be eclipsed in sales by Ford, and the Falcon enjoyed a six-year stint as Australia's best-selling car. But not only were the 80s hard on Holden, it was hard on the entire Australian auto industry. Imports were becoming cheaper as manufacturers began to open in developing nations, and this threatened Australia's home industry. The federal Labor government would intervene with the Button Plan, which stressed that Australian manufacturers should focus on their flagship cars, which pretty much meant Falcons and Commodores, and that the rest of their range could be supplemented with rebadged import cars. Ford began rebranding Nissan Patrols as Mavericks, Holden rebranded the Isuzu Faster as the Holden Rodeo, and these Japanese companies were able to rebadge Holden and Ford's cars in return. And while yes, this did diversify and concentrate Ford and Holden's range, Australian consumers weren't stupid. Cars like the Rodeo succeeded, but most others were seen right through. Why buy a Ford Maverick when you can just buy a Patrol? And why buy a Nissan Ute when you can just buy the Falcon? So with all that behind us, entering into the 2000s, Ford would take a critical misstep when releasing their latest Falcon, the AU. Which was a good car, but it looked ugly. And something as simple as that saw Ford permanently fall behind the Commodore in sales. And so Ford was behind Holden, and yet Holden still lost its top spot in the market in 2003 to Toyota. And you can argue Toyota was an Australian manufacturer, but its entire range was Japanese cars, and so it was clear where the market was going. Australia's car industry had been living off government subsidy for just about its entire existence, but under the Liberal government, Australia would begin making free trade deals, with many Asian countries seeing import tariffs basically vanish. Low-cost Japanese cars, which were often manufactured cheaply in Korea or Thailand, began to flood into the Australian market. The consumer was spoiled for choice, and this was all eating into Holden and Ford's sales. As sales were hitting all-time lows, costs had to be cut, and local manufacturing was quickly under the knife. In October 2016, Ford would close its Broadmeadows factory, seeing both the Falcon and its workers left behind. Holden and Toyota would join Ford the following year. With Holden closing its doors, so too did it close its doors on the entire Australian auto industry. The Commodore would continue as a foreign import car, but just as Australia wasn't anything without Holden, Holden wasn't anything without Australia, and the Commodore is ceasing production this year. And so we can only now look back and reflect on all Australia's had but you can't help but ask, what is there for the future? Well, probably nothing. It's still super cheap for cars to be made in developing countries and be imported. Our modern world is quickly losing balance between offering local work and offering affordable products. And the best person to answer that question is definitely not someone that does YouTube for a living. Now, if you need me, I'll be looking at rusty falcons on Gumtree. But before I go, let me ask you. Do you want some speed? Yeah, you heard me. Speed. The online documentary series about the history of transportation that you can find right on CuriosityStream. So you can check out that series and the thousands of other documentaries and originals on the streaming service. They cover history, science, nature, technology, society, and more. And whatever device you're watching this video on, you can also watch CuriosityStream. So head over to curiositystream.com slash feature history and get yourself a 31 day trial. And it's worth adding that not only will a membership to CuriosityStream get you their service, but it'll also get you an account to Nebula, which is another streaming service that features educational channels like myself and hosts all our video libraries as well as exclusive originals. So head into the description and you'll find both those sites there. Just waiting for you.